Green. How's everybody? All right, we'd like to call this meeting to order at 9 o'clock, 9.30 a.m. I ask that as a courtesy to all that you ensure that you've silenced your cell phones. Also would ask that you, <clears throat> and I ask the directors that when you are ready to speak to please turn on your microphone so we can hear you. For the record, I'll note that the public meeting notice was properly posted as required by law, and the notice of this board meeting was provided to each of the directors. All the directors, with the exception of Michael Fernandez, indicated that they would be present at this meeting. We've now reached the portion of the meeting where we have set aside time to hear from you, the general public. Those interested in providing comments by Please fill out the card at the reception desk. Seeing that no one wishes to speak at this time, we will move forward on the agenda. And before we start, I would like to welcome all of our new board members to this meeting. Um, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to start by uh, doing a quick introduction. So Director Tom Abraham, Director Abraham is from Sugar Land and is the President and Chief Officer of TransStar AC Supply. He received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Tampa and a Master's in Business Administration from Delhi University. Welcome, Tom Abraham. Director Gary Boren. Director Boren from Lubbock is a retired businessman and music producer after 40 years as Senior Vice President of G. Boren Services Incorporated. He's a member of several Lubbock and Texas Tech organizations and he received a Bachelor of Science from Texas Tech University. Welcome, Director Boren. And Director Fernandez is not here, but I will go ahead and read his bio. Director Fernandez from Abilene is Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer and a member of the Board of Directors at Texas National Bank in Sweetwater. He also serves on several organizations in Abilene and received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Louisiana State University and a Master's of Business Administration from Texas A&M University in San Antonio. We want to welcome Dr. Fer or Mr. Fernandez. <laughs> Director Austin Ruiz. Dr. Ruiz from Harker Heights is owner and optometrist with Colleen Vision Source. He's a member of several optometry organizations and received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Houston and a Doctor of Optometry from the University of Houston College of Optometry. Welcome, Director Dr. Ruiz. <laughs> Director David Savage. Director Savage from Katy is Senior Director Contracts and Commercial for Team Industrial Services at their Sugar Land Headquarters. He has global experience in industrial water and wastewater treatment. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Texas A&M University. Welcome, Director Savage. <laughs> Director Darren Yancey. Director Yancey for Burleson is a consultant for Hub International Insurance Services and co-host of the Automotive Edge radio show and Truck Talk, a consumer education talk show. He has spent many years in insurance and financial services and in commercial real estate and business brokerage. He received a Bachelor's of Business Administration in Finance and Accounting from the University of Texas at Arlington. Welcome, Director Yancey. <laughs> Director, I'm so glad to welcome you to the board and know that you will contribute greatly to the leadership of the, and the future direction of the Brazos River Authority as we maintain, manage, and plan for the future needs, water needs, of our Texas citizens. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll move 
to the um, first agenda item, report and possible direct uh, discussion on uh, from the general manager and CEO, David Collinsworth. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I will apologize in advance now. Uh, my portion of this meeting is sponsored by Hall's Monthalatum. <laughs> um, and until we eradicate all cedar trees in Texas, this is something I'm having to live with. Uh, also, on behalf of the staff, I'd like to welcome the new board members. We look forward to your expertise in, in helping us move this fine organization uh, to even a, a higher standard and, and a better place in helping us develop water and making sure that we continue to focus on transparency and the things that uh, that we want to do to serve the citizens of the state of Texas. I will also follow suit and introduce you to a few folks uh, just very briefly, but I want you to meet two very important new employees that we have. Uh, Sergeant uh, Lambert Jefferson. Lambert, would you stand up? Lambert is, uh, uh, the he's not the chief of police, he's a sergeant, but he's over our police force at Possum Kingdom. Lambert is a certified peace officer Lambert is a certified firefighter, and Lambert is a certified EMT. The folks around Possum Kingdom are in real good hands. Welcome aboard, Lambert. <laughs> and then also, uh, it's an honor to introduce you to Randall McCarty. Randall, where are you? There you are. Randall's our new Possum Kingdom uh, project manager. Uh, it's very, very unique that you can find somebody uh, when you're looking for a project manager of a reservoir that's worked on reservoirs for his entire career, uh, Randall comes to us from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers where he has moved around Texas working on reservoirs. So he's going to uh, just add to our organization and, and bring tremendous credentials and experience. So welcome aboard. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the last, uh, the last few board meetings, I've been starting them off with uh, uh, a health and safety moment. And I was really wondering if, if there was any benefit to that. We do that a lot in our staff meetings, just to remind people of, of being uh, aware and cautious and safe. And then I had a, a, one of your fellow board members uh, last night remind me that his tires were full of uh, air and he had met all the pressures, which was my safety moment last time. So I'll start with a safety moment, and it's a simple flu prevention tips. Uh, get vaccinated if you haven't got vaccinated. Uh, wash your hands. Uh, do the elbow cough. You'll see me do that today. And don't drink after your fellow board members. <laughs> uh, this week was monumental for the state of Texas in the fact that President Trump uh, uh, commanded the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army to withdraw the water supply rule. Uh, that was a huge win for the BRA. Uh, Brad Burnett, Matt Phillips, uh, Aaron Abel spent a tremendous amount of their time over the last two years making sure that the uh, the folks in Austin understood what was going on. We spent a lot of time on an airplane back and forth to D.C. making sure that uh, our congressional delegate understood the significance of, of what that rule could do to Texas. Uh, and I'm proud to say that uh, the president did the right thing, and I think we're, in, I think we're headed in the right direction uh, with the withdrawal of that rule. Also, two weeks ago, we had our first uh, uh, symposium, if you will, with one of our larger customers. I reminded you last meeting uh, that we're going to have some of our larger customers coming in and spending time with us to really make sure that we understand their challenges as Texas continues to grow. Uh, Gulf Coast Water Authority was here and did a tremendous job, and, and it was really beneficial for us. So uh, it was very much uh, time well spent. Uh, also, uh, one of the things I want to start doing in our, our uh, agenda here is to uh, introduce you to some of the folks that you don't have the opportunity to meet. You've heard me say this before, and I mean it uh, sincerely. Water is not our most important, it's not our most valuable asset. It's the people that we have that protect that water, protect our assets, and make it available to the state of Texas. And today I want to introduce you to Randy Locke. Randy, would you stand please? <clears throat> Randy doesn't like this. <laughs> because if I invited Randy to come up here and tell you about himself, he wouldn't do it. He would come up here and he would tell you that all of his successes are because of the staff that are around him. I would tell you that their success is because of his leadership and his mentoring. Uh, Randy's been with us for 34 years. Uh, he's got uh, over 26 years of having an A wastewater license, which is as high as you can achieve in the wastewater business. Randy is uh, a, a key reason that BRA's business line of operating wastewater treatment plants has been successful for so long. 
Uh, and if those of you that have taken a tour and got to know Randy, you know two things right quick. You walk away understanding that he is an expert in what he does, as good as anybody in the state of Texas, and you understand that he has a passion for this organization. Tremendous respect for Randy. Randy, congratulations, and thanks for being here. Uh, last but not least, uh, we're going to uh, proceed with our agenda. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. When we have our one executive session item, uh, the board's going to go next door to the uh, uh, main, what we call the main conference room, and that will allow our guests to just sit here and not have to move and, and relocate all your stuff. So that's, that's how we'll handle executive session today. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Agenda item number two. Discussion and possible action on fiscal year ended 2019 comprehensive comprehensive annual financial report. And before we call David Thompson and um, Baker Tilly to present this agenda item, um, Director Hubert, as chairman of the administration and audit committee, where are you right here? Would you like to comment sure. on the committee's? Um, committee's actions regarding the audit. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Our administration and audit committee met this morning uh, prior to the uh, board of directors meeting. Our committee consists of directors uh, Bill Rankin, Gary Boren, Judy Crone, Alan Sanderson, and myself. And we listened to a presentation um, of our Brazos River Authority's comprehensive annual financial report presented by Aaron Worthman, who will be speaking here a little later. He is a Baker Tilly Virtue and Kraus LLP, an independent accounting firm. And this is our first audit after transitioning to this new accounting firm. Uh, the report was very good, showed no problems. Um, and we, uh, of course, attribute that to our professionalism of our management and staff here at the BRA. So it was a very good report. Okay. All right. David. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, each year I bring to you the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit. It's, it's as of August 31st, FY 2019. Uh, talk to you a little bit about the purpose of it <clears throat> and then basically the highlights of it. Uh, once I talk the highlights, then we'll get into uh, having Aaron give his report. His report will be similar to the one that was given in the audit committee this morning. And then you can ask questions if you have to to Aaron on that. So let's talk a little bit about the purpose for auditing the CAFR. Uh, this is a financial report <clears throat> is that we uh, make sure that it presents fairly in accordance with accepted accounting principles, general accepted accounting principle, government standards uh, board uh, as well. Uh, help the new people that, and, the, and the directors. The CAFR is a historical document. It is presenting the results from FY 2019 at the end of August 31st. It's an accrual or, or gap basis type uh, financial statements. Now, each quarter, I present to you the differences against the budget and the actuals against the budget. Now, then the annual uh, operating plan or the budget is more of a forward-looking perspective document, and it is on a primary cash basis. So throughout the presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about the differences between the CAFR and the uh, basically the uh, budget. There are three sections to the, the CAFR itself. There's an introduction section, and the introduction section is the transmittal letter. This is basically the key events that happened in 2019. Then you have your balance sheet and income statement, the, the, the bulk of the, uh, the CAFR itself, with their normal, uh, the normal, the necessary disclosures and footnotes that go to it. <clears throat> then the last section is the st statistical. And it's an audited, but it does provide you uh, things like, you know, uh, debt capacities, uh, financial trends, things to help explain our financial statements and how they, they operate. I do want to mention that the CAFR is organized under the GFOA, the Government Finance Office Association requirements. For the last 33 years, we have received the, uh, a prestigious award for reporting excellence on the CAFR. 
as Rick had, had mentioned too, that prestigious award and the, the way the CAF is presented can only be done by the team that I have. It's a very strong team that we have, as well as those that have contributed to the CAFR. So let's talk a little bit about the differences between the CAFR and the audit, uh, the, uh, the budget. Back in July of 2018, the budget was uh, adopted by the board. This is the results of what happened in 2019 against the budget. Back in October, I gave you the fourth quarter numbers. It was approximately $16 million of surplus on, on the budget. And that's due basically to $8 million of revenue uh, over budget. And that comes from the interruptible water that we do not budget for. As well as expenses were about six to seven million dollars, and that's underspending. Also, the Corps of Engineers had some underspending on their eight core lakes. This is basically the operating income, as you might call it, for the CAFR. So let's talk about the eight million dollars difference. The first element of it is looking between accrual basis and cash. So depreciation of nine million dollars is a gap requirement in the CAFR but is not included in the budget because it's not a cash item. Now, principal payments on our debt of $4 million is a cash item and treated as an expenditure in the budget. But when you come back to the CAFR, it's a balance sheet adjustment. That nets about seven, $5 million of expense there. We also have the net effect of GASB 68 allocation. This deals with the pension cost, and that is $2 million. Uh, capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are things for vehicles, large equipments that are expenditures and cash disbursements. But when you go to the CAFR, we capitalize those assets. Last, what is CAFR? Uh, it's a comprehensive <coughs> annual financial report. Sorry. Um, I, I abbreviated it to start with the uh, rate stabilization reserve is taken out of our reserves. And it's basically an adjustment. Uh, in the CAFR, we do not recognize rate stabilization reserves, but we do use it as rate setting, rate setting in the budget. So let's look at the two years comparative. Uh, one of the adjustments we had between uh, 18 and 19 was Brushy Creek uh, wastewater uh, facility, where we transferred it back to the customers. That was about a two, little over $2 million revenue loss that we had there. And then the interest income here is another large number increase. And that was, even though the rates have gone down quite a bit from the Fed, if you go back in time, they were pretty high. And so uh, these were unbudgeted increases from the investments that we have. So with that, I will turn it over to Aaron. And then once Aaron has his presentation, I'll come back uh, to read the resolution to adopt it. So Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning. Again, my name is Aaron Worthman. I'm the partner in charge of the financial audit uh, with Baker Tilly out of our Austin office. Uh, before, before I jump in, uh, since most of you, uh, since I'm new to most of you, just wanted to briefly give you my background. Um, I've been working in the uh, utility space uh, with organizations such as yourselves for 20 some years. Uh, some of the audits that I conduct of your peer organization, uh, CPS Energy, uh, San Antonio Water System, Lower Colorado River Authority, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, GBRA, and San Antonio River Authority, just to name a few. Uh, but again, I, I've spent my entire career working with uh, organizations such as yourselves. And with that, I'm uh, pleased to report on the fiscal year 2019 financial statement audit. What I want to do first is just give you an audit overview. You know, what exactly is it that we do as part of our audit? Uh, then as your auditors, we have a required communication to go through. So I'll touch on those highlights. Uh, discuss our internal controls, you know, our findings of internal controls that came about as part of the audit process. And then lastly, open it up for uh, any questions. So again, as David had mentioned, uh, we prepare the audit, or we conduct the audit, of your comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, 
Our audit was in accordance with U.S. generally accepted auditing standards, which are the auditing standards that we follow uh, when we conduct any audit. Um, uh, in addition, because you are a governmental entity, there's additional standards we need to follow uh, called government auditing standards. They give us additional uh, standards relative to uh, continuing professional education, independence, supervision of our audit team, quality control, and due care. Uh, and then um, lastly, I'll go through this uh, required communication with you folks. So uh, this was obviously our first year as your auditors. And going into a first year, uh, in my experience, can be extremely challenging. One, uh, the client's not quite sure what to expect from us, and, and vice versa. Um, I will say, over the past five years, just in Texas, uh, we've had a number of first-year utility audits. And I will say, out of all of them, uh, this one uh, went the best. It went the smoothest. We were very pleased. Um, Management was ready, uh, available. Uh, we often will have revisions to the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, we did have some best practice recommendations and some minor uh, changes, but nothing major. Uh, we were very pleased. Uh, and, uh, your, your team did a great job uh, in the past and continue to this year. So for a first year audit, there was more work because it's the first year on both ends, uh, but we were very pleased with the results. Uh, so to that, uh, management and their staff did a great job. Uh, our audit schedule was maintained. You know That should go without saying, but I will say for many first-year audits, that's not the case. Uh, we will find significant issues. It will delay reporting, uh, but we had none of that. It literally almost felt like, a, like we'd been doing the audit for a couple years. It did go very smoothly. But just to give some perspective, uh, we had two weeks of field work conducted on site, one week uh, late summer was our preliminary field work, and then one week of final on site, and then the rest of the audit was done remotely through web portals. Your last day of audit field work was November 1st, 2019, and then we spent that time pretty much through now or our report date uh, taking a look at your annual financial report and testing that. I discussed with the audit committee earlier, if we were to break the audit down into uh, percentages, I'd say roughly 30% of what we do is specific to internal controls. Uh, taking a look at your major processes, identifying what those internal controls should be. We then make sure that those controls are in place, and then we test those controls for effectiveness. In the areas that uh, we find controls are missing or not effective, we will warrant additional audit field work time to that, also known as substantive testing. So 40% of what we do is due to substantive testing. And then the remaining 30% deals with our planning for the audit and then the financial reporting, taking a look at that comprehensive annual financial report. I uh, just wanted to show a couple of the major areas. You know, certainly if you look at your balance sheet, uh, the largest makeup of your balance sheet is your fixed assets. So we do spend a lot of time there looking at your asset additions and retirements. Your cash and investments, you know, confirming those with your banking, uh, your banks. Disbursements, payroll, uh, your billings and receivable, uh, those types of things. But again, this is a highlight or the highlights of what we look at when we conduct your financial audit. Our audit was performed in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, as I had mentioned earlier. Our audit objective is to obtain reasonable assurance that your financial statements are free of material misstatement. At the end of this year's audit, your statements have received an unmodified opinion, which is also known as a clean opinion, which is the highest level of assurance that we can provide as auditors. Uh, we identified no material weaknesses and significant deficiencies, which I'll touch on in a bit. If we look at your required communication, we also send out this in written form as well. A couple things I wanted to highlight. You know, the profession continues to look at independence, making sure that your audit firm is independent. And I'm here to report that our firm and every individual on your engagement is independent, in fact, and appearance uh, relative to your organization. Uh, we did not have any significant or unusual transactions. If we had those, we would need to disclose those. If we had any changes in accounting policies or new accounting pronouncements that were implemented, we would have to disclose those as well. And to this year's audit, there were none. You know, we often get asked, and we talked about this a little bit with the audit committee, uh, if you were to look at your 
a financial report, you know, what weaknesses or what areas should you be most aware of of users and governance of those financial statements? And I would say that answer always has to do with significant estimates because they're exactly that, they're estimates. Uh, when you take a look at your financials, the largest estimates you folks have uh, is relative to your pension obligations, uh, your pension liability from your single employer plan and then also your Texas plan. Uh, so we take a look at those. We'll look at the specialists or the actuaries that help determine those numbers, and we make sure that those estimates are reasonable. Uh, we did not have any adjusting journal entries or any waived entries as part of this year's audit. And again, I'd say that's probably unusual uh, for our firm uh, coming into an organization uh, with the background we have in utilities of not finding any changes, uh, no adjusting journal entries or even minor waived entries. Again, that's the testament uh, to your management team and uh, their knowledge, quite frankly, of utility accounting. If we had any audit findings or concerns, we would need to disclose those. Uh, we didn't have any of those. Uh, just know if uh, at any point during the year we did come across a major finding, uh, this would not be the first time you'd hear about that. I would have had those discussions. You know, if I were in your shoes, I'd want to know right away. Uh, I would definitely have those conversations with you folks ahead of time. So again, there would be no surprises. And one thing I want to note, you know, I mentioned earlier, we provide an opinion on your financial statements. We do not provide an opinion on internal controls. However, as part of our audit, we need to test internal controls and look at those. Uh, when we do have internal control findings, we're required to communicate those to you. And our profession makes us uh, differentiate these controls, categorize them by severity. So the most severe would be something known as a material weakness. And it's a control breakdown or, uh, or an implemented control that's not effective, that the breakdown or lack of control would lead to more than a reasonable possibility that you could have a material error in your financial statements. And you had not, we noted none uh, during our audit. The next category would be called a significant deficiency. It's less severe than a material weakness, but it's large enough that it warrants the attention of governance. And we did not have any significant deficiencies. Uh, what we do have as part of an audit, uh, because we do spend a lot of time looking at internal controls, is we, every year, will have minor control deficiencies, best practices, recommendations, things like that. We communicate those with the management team, and I would say with every client I have, every year, we will always have some sort of IT recommendations, minor recommendations, just because that, that universe is constantly changing, cyber is constantly changing. Uh, so we had a few of those with management. Uh, we discussed those uh, as net part of next year's audit. We'll take a look at those to see where they're at in the remediation of those, and we will test those. And certainly, if we find areas that aren't remediated and continue to be a concern, that's when we would have those discussions with you folks as well. But again, uh, we would expect to see these types of things as we go through. Uh, lastly, uh, we want to uh, thank you know, management and the team for all the work that they do. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into not only our end of an audit, but certainly uh, management's end. And uh, to have us here on site you know, for three weeks working on these engagements, answering questions, interrupting their day-to-day -day duties uh, can, be, can be pretty exhausting. And uh, they did a great job and uh, quickly communicated those answers to us, so we appreciate all their help. Uh, and with that, I would like to open up for uh, any questions anyone might have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Okay, before I read the resolution, I just want to make a comment that <clears throat> once the board uh, adopts and approves the, uh, uh, the CAFR, that we will uh, publish it. We will also send it out to, in, in addition to TCEQ, but the, also to other state regulatory agencies such as the State Audit uh, Office. Uh, we also send it to Texas Water Development Board. We also send it to bond underwriters and bond rating groups and other groups that have requested to have their uh, uh, copy of it. So with that, if there's any other questions, I'll read the resolution. 
be resolved that the Board of Directors hereby accepts the Brazos River Authority's comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year ended 2019 and approves its filing with T, uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and be further resolved that the Chief Financial Officer is hereby designated to file the report and the annual filings of the affidavit with the Executive Director of the Texas Commission on uh, Environmental Quality. You have heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? First motion by Jerry Smith, second by Rick Hubert. Thank you. Please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. Director Tavis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Abraham? Yes. Director Boren? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Crone? Yes. Director Chance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director <coughs> Lee? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Agenda item number three, discussion and possible action on interlocal agreement for Bell County Aquifer Storage and Recovery, ASR, study by Brad Brunette, Central and Lower Basin Regional Manager. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is an action item for authorization for us to enter an interlocal agreement with Bell County and other local entities within Bell County to conduct an aquifer storage and recovery study in Bell County, or an ASR study as they're referred to a lot of times. The Bell County Judge's Office has been leading this effort over the last six months, coordinating with us and other entities in the county to take a look at aquifer storage and recovery there within Bell County. And some of you may recall we're involved with a similar effort with the city of Georgetown and Williamson County where we're also looking at aquifer storage and recovery there. Uh, just real quick, aquifer storage and recovery simply involves taking surface water or some other source of water that's uh, available at the surface, treating it, and then injecting that water back into the aquifer through a well for storage and use later on. And there are really two basic categories of uses for water that's stored in an ASR project. Uh, one type of use might be for seasonal peaking for an entity that's like a city or, or a, a water district that's got a water plant and they want to have some extra water available in the summer so that they don't have to run their treatment plant as hard during the summer. So that's one type of use. And then you also see some entities essentially banking water, just putting it under the ground so that you know when we have a drought year, there's a store of water available there. So that's kind of, uh, kind of what we're talking about with ASR. It's really gained a lot of attention in Texas as well over the last several years. In particular, the legislature has been very interested in ASR and passed several bills in the last session that, that encourage future development and further study of it. So there are a number of entities that are participating in this study. Many of these are BRA customers. I believe there are nine right now. Uh, the, the source of the water for this project in Bell County would likely come from BRA surface water in either Lakes Belton or Stillhouse Hollow. And again, many of these are our customers. And so with the, the source water being in our reservoirs, we feel like we need to be involved in the study effort. Uh, the county and the Clearwater Underground Water Conservation District will be the ones that are managing the actual effort. And the work is going to be performed by a company called Interra Geoscience and Engineering <coughs> Solutions. Uh, here you see the scope of work. It's basically just three three uh, big phases or three high-level phase descriptions I have here. The costs that you see here are the total costs for the whole project, so those aren't BRA costs. Essentially, you take those costs and divide them by nine, and that's what we're looking at is, is our portion of the cost. So initially, phase one will be authorized, and our cost share for that would be about $2,778. And then at the end of phase one, if the nine entities uh, want to continue to go forward to phase two, we would go to phase two and so forth to phase three. So we've got a resolution here for you today that would uh, ask you to authorize us entering the interlocal agreement to participate in this study. The total cost to us, if we do all three phases and all the entities participate, is about $10,556. 
but I've got $15,000 in the resolution just in case a couple of the other entities were to drop out and we would want to go forward to give us a little bit of slack there. So that's the that's what I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions or read the resolution. Does Cook County have some kind of limestone? Uh, we we hold the water. We can store it there. There's there's two aquifers in the county. One is the the Edwards, which is kind of a, a right. limestone yeah. uh, similar to what they have in Williamson County and down south toward Austin. It's a totally different type of aquifer than a lot of the other ones. The Trinity aquifer is an aquifer that's uh, spans a pretty big region of the, the Brazos Basin, and it's more of a sand type aquifer. And I think when we're talking about ASR in Bell County, you're really looking at options for the Trinity, not so much the, the limestone Edwards aquifer system. So the recovery would be 1%? You have that's what we're gonna, that, that's what this study's gonna look at, exactly, to see if it's even feasible. Uh, and there may be places in the county where it is and other places where it's not, just depending on the, the hydrogeology of the aquifer. Director Lattimore had a question. Who would, uh, assuming the study is successful and proceeds into a project, who would be the beneficiary? In other words, who's, who's going to own the water when they get when they get to it? Uh, it could be some of these individual entities. Uh, if they're taking, for instance, all of these are not all of them, but most of those enti entities have water contracts with the BRA, and they're take or pay contracts. And so there may be cases where some of these entities could take water that they already have under contract for B from BRA. Uh, treat more of it, put it in the ground, and then it's available for their system for use later on. Uh, we may end up discovering the potential for a bigger regional solution where rather than just an individual entity uh, taking the water and probably using it for peaking needs, that we would have more of a, a regional drought type of storage in the ground. So it could be beneficiaries anywhere from any of those nine individual entities to a collective group or a regional type project. That's, that's a great question because for the BRA to be involved in all three phases of the study, I think we're going to have to get through phase one and maybe phase two to realize that there's a benefit for the system for us to continue funding a large scale project. So if there is regional, if there is a regional application, I think we're involved. If there's not a regional application and it's localized, uh, once we determine that, I think then that would be where we would end our participation in the study. So then. If I understand, Brad, what you're saying, if this proves successful, it might serve as a pilot program for others of these kinds of things that the BRA would be involved in. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Yes, sir. You treated the water. Right so uh, there, there, there are rules, and the rules are kind of evolving rapidly with regard to being able to, to treat the water and put it underground. Basically, you don't want to take dirty surface water or water that's got you know things in it and put it in the ground and contaminate clean groundwater. So, uh, the most of these applications where they're taking it, running it through a typical surface water treatment plant, just like you know a city is going to be treating water for their customers, and rather than sending it downstream to the customers at the end of the process, they would inject it into the ground for storage layer. So. It's, like clean yes, sir. Typical surface water treatment. I would contend that our mission is to produce water, and we've made a profit doing that. Why would we not want to do it in a way that we can produce more water? So anything that produces water within our basin uh, benefits our customers. And there's more water out there, it's going to be a lower cost to other customers. Whether or not we wind up in control of that is not as important as the fact that it's being produced in the basin. I agree. Absolutely agree. All right. Seeing no other questions, please read the resolution. Sure. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the general manager slash CEO to enter into an interlocal agreement with Bell County and other local entities to collectively fund and evaluate aquifer storage and recovery in Bell County with the total Brazos River Authority contribution in an amount not to exceed $15,000. You've heard the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt Director Wilson? Second. And second by Jim Lattimore. Please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Abraham? Yes. Director Boren? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Keeper? Yes. Director Crum? Yes. <coughs> Director Chance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. 
Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Reed? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Agenda item number four, <coughs> possible action on Castle Project. And an upper basin regional manager. Presiding officer and board before. Uh before Mike uh, gives his presentation, there's a few data points that I want I want you to have with you because uh, this is a really significant project to BRA uh, in our dedication to making sure that we're doing everything that we can to protect our assets that that store so much of our system water. Uh, Morris Shepherd Dam at Possum Kingdom is uh, a approaching, let's say, 100 years old. Construction began in 1938. Uh, it stores a significant amount of our water. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, we noticed that the dam had moved about four inches, which is a real big deal. Uh, we paid a significant amount of attention to that, and that really helped the organization focus on uh, the importance of uh, an annual maintenance regime that allows you to, to take care of your assets. Uh, we lowered the lake. They drilled piers. There's, there's a lot of information about that um, we can also at a later time get into how the dam was built and why it moved the four inches that it did uh, there's pk dam is in excellent shape there's normal degradation for a dam that's that old uh, the water quality of the reservoir is very challenging because of the high salinity and then also because of where the dam is built and how it's built hydrogen sulfide gas builds up behind the dam and that's very uh, very tough, if you will, on the concrete. There's also a, uh, a tremendous amount of discussion going on at the state legislative level on the safety of dams and what organizations are doing to maintain those dams. And we're more than willing and welcome to talk about that because we spend so much effort and time uh, at our three dams making sure that, uh, that we're going to get maximum life out of it. So I wanted you to have that data point. This is a uh, a very significant study that we're doing that will lead us into the future and help us prioritize what we're doing at the dam, how we set our rates, uh, and uh, how we spend our money. Right. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, Presiding Officer Flores, thank you, uh, members of the board. Good morning. Uh, we initially briefed this project to the board at our October 2018 uh, meeting. I'm going to provide a history of the uh, project, an overview, and then list some of the objectives. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our engineering consultants, uh, Stuart Bakhti with uh, Gannett Fleming. He was able to join us here today. And he's going to really talk specifically uh, to the investigation and testing program uh, that we're going to be carrying out here, that we propose to carry out here in phase two. The, the Castle Project, or Concrete Assessment and Service Life uh, Evaluation Project, it's a comprehensive evaluation of the concrete and the dam components. Uh, and it culminates into a risk-based assessment uh, in which those areas uh, that we've identified that have the greater risk, uh, we identified that for subsequent repair. Moore Shepherd Dam uh, construction, as David said, began in 1938. Uh, it was completed in uh, 1941, so roughly uh, Moore Shepherd Dam is approaching 80 years old. Uh, our objective, a theme that you'll hear uh, throughout this is uh, to extend the service life of this facility, so we want to maximize the useful life of our infrastructure. Uh, whenever we set up the scope of services, uh, we intentionally uh, designed it to where they would follow a phased approach, and, and this provides several benefits to us, uh, to our consultant and our organization. Uh, first off, it allows us to be methodical and efficient uh, because of the project scale and because of the uncertainty involved. Uh, secondly, it uh, will provide further uh, reduced scope changes and then allow for credible scope development as we progress to each next, each next successive phase. And then lastly, uh, uh, one of the big ones is it's very transparent. Uh, we're able to talk to you today, walk you through what uh, our process is, uh, the next steps, and then uh, uh, 
I really just provide updates to you instead of coming to the board all at once asking for a big lump sum of money we're able to come and walk through the project as it progresses Uh, the castle project, there's four phases associated with this project, if you'll recall. Uh, this slide illustrates the various phases. The first phase consists of the development of the investigation and testing program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a subsequent slide. Phase two is the execution or carrying out uh, that investigation and testing program. And then phase three is an analysis of that testing. And then phase four, we come back and there's, uh, we develop a matrix-based plan incorporating risk we're gonna, where we're gonna identify and target those areas that we wanna focus uh, our testing upon that we need to out. This particular slide, it, it's really uh, just representative. It's a flowchart representation of the prior slide. I know it's, it's a little bit hard to read, uh, but it uh, uh, shows the various, the four phases, and then some of the tasks that are associated specifically uh, to each phase. I said I was going to talk about uh, phase one a little bit. I'm going to go through the history and show you what we've accomplished to date. Uh, when we started Gannett Fleming, uh, took all the documents uh, related to Moore Shepherd Dam, uh, starting from the 1930s all the way up to present day. So you can imagine there's hundreds of documents, volumes of documents that are one to three inch binders, uh, reports. They reviewed those documents and then they developed a uh, comprehensive searchable database. It's where I can go in and uh, insert a keyword, like say the word corbel. And uh, it'll go back, look through 80 years worth of data, and it'll highlight that word corbel so I can read about that information. So that's a monumental effort in itself. That'll help us as a staff going forward, and it'll help uh, our engineers as opposed to going and searching through hard copies in our central files or even scanned PDF copies. So that was where we started off. Uh, then Gannett Fleming performed a simplified structural evaluation and this information is used to gain a general understanding of the structural components of the dam. So they go in and they look at the buttresses, they look at the deck slab panels, uh, they look at our corbels, uh, the flip bucket, the apron. So they get a comprehensive understanding of uh, what our structural situation is like. And then that information is used in a risk analysis workshop, wherein we go look at uh, potential failure modes and then apply quantitative risk or develop quantitative risk associated with that. What that was, was a, a workshop in which uh, our staff at Possum Kingdom, our technical services staff here in central office, our upper basin staff, and then the Gannett Fleming team uh, all met up at PK Possum Kingdom for four to five days. We sat in a room for eight to nine hours a day and went through this workshop. And what culminates out of that workshop is the information that helps define and develop and target those areas that we want to focus our efforts on. And so what that, what that culminated into was really this uh, FN chart or this matrix. And I, I know uh, the numbers and the letterings don't mean anything, but I'll, I'll explain what it is. It's pretty intuitive. Uh, red is more critical areas that we want to focus upon, and then yellow and subs subsequently on down towards green. Uh, <coughs> briefly, the areas that uh, we're looking at that uh, showed up in the red are our corbels, uh, our deck slab panels, and then uh, our foundation issues. And Stuart's going to go in a little bit more detail, and we'll have uh, some photographs that will uh, identify what a deck slab panel is, what a corbel is, etc. Uh, and then the other, the last. Uh, item that was in here was our foundation. And, and David touched on our foundation a little bit. Uh, we had some significant movement. At four and a half inches is significant in the dam safety world. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, as David said, we took immediate action. We remediated that. We lowered the lake about 13 feet. Uh, then we installed relief wells, uh, which reduced the hydrostatic pressure, uh, that, the uplift pressure on the dam. And then uh, uh, we also installed some concrete ballast blocks and uh, some ballast gravel. And so I would offer to any of the board directors that have the opportunity uh, to come out and visit Possum Kingdom and you'll see this or the, these remediative repairs that we had made to the dam. Uh, but I'll, I'll let Stuart talk a little bit more uh, about how we're going to address these. Uh, but essentially what I wanted to show on this chart was these are the critical areas that we're going to focus our investigation and testing program upon. So that leads us to phase two, uh, which 
Uh, we're going to focus our investigation and testing program on those er areas that were identified uh, in the red on uh, the FN chart. And basically what this is, is it's taking a more surgical approach uh, to it and a better resource or better use of our resources. Instead of just going out real broad base, this focuses on the areas that we need to focus upon. Uh, to move forward with the phase two process, it'll take about 18 weeks to complete. Uh, and uh, after that 18 weeks, we'll come back to the board again uh, uh, for subsequent approval to proceed with phase three, hopefully. I'm going to turn it over to Stuart uh, Vakti with Gannett Fleming right now. He's going to talk, like I said, in a little bit more detail. I struggle sometimes with how much detail the board wants to know, but I, I think this is a pretty significant project and for you all to understand exactly uh, the, the methodologies. We looked at 20 to 25 different destructive and non-destructive testing, and so I think it's important for you all to understand what we're looking forward. After Stuart's through, I'll come back. Uh, I have a resolution for your consideration, and I'll close at that point. So I'll turn it over to Stuart. While Stuart's on his way up, for those of you that are new to our board, uh, every just about every spring we'll we'll coordinate a tour for you to come out and crawl all over the dam and, and put your hands on it and see it and, and that. So we'll be we'll be working with you soon to, to start coordinating that tour. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for having me here today. What I'll do is I'll try and give a brief overview drill down, no pun intended, on the investigation program, uh, like Mike mentioned. So he talked a little bit about the SQRA and the prioritization of these features. So through that process, we identify, we break out the structure by its different features. We look at uh, all those features, the loading conditions, the, uh, uh, the probability, the consequence of those potential failures, and we categorize those. And that's that really helps us identify what the critical features are that we want to focus our investigation program on uh, to help us be efficient in that process. So you can take a look. I broke out the ones that are highlighted here. You can take a look at those in the pie chart. Uh, the three critical features that are identified through that SQRA process are the slabs and corbels, like Mike mentioned, and then foundation-related, like David mentioned. Uh, the foundation-related, that is a uh, obviously an issue that's been identified. It was in the process of failing at the time. Uh, they've gone back and done a lot of uh, remediation efforts on that already, so the risk has been lowered, but it is still identified as a potential failure mode because this this actual failure mode has did start uh, to occur. Quick question. Yes. Word failure in water gets my ears. Right. Um, are we... Do we have anybody, residents around the lake that are in any type of danger right now? No, not right now. So in the name safety world, we we break down the structure and we break down and we want to understand the risk and probability of something that happens. You break that down by feature, loading condition, and consequence and likelihood of failure. And so we do that and we study how all the ways that it could fail uh, because obviously a failure of the dam would be catastrophic, right? So that's how we break down uh, our assessment to focus in on what on what's done. This is this is part of the uh, risk informed decision making process that we use to understand a very complex structure with very uh, with a lot of different components. I might be getting ahead of your presentation, but I'm assuming we have timelines in here for for making the necessary repairs so that we don't get into safety issues. Right. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. I mean, right now, uh, like David mentioned that. You know, you want to get out ahead of this. You want to be responsible dam owners, which you guys are doing, and that's why we're doing this study. This is uh, an 80-year-old structure, right? And uh, concrete structures have normal deterioration. It is in good shape right now, but there is normal deterioration that's going on. So we're studying that to prioritize how to extend the service life. Okay. So, like I mentioned, the slabs and the corbels of were identified as priority features. Uh, also, that bottom pie ch chart, we take a look at what the initiators are. Um, so uh, of those, we talked about the foundation instability already, uh, structural inadequacy, and deterioration. And the reason why those two pop up is the initiators in here, and this isn't necessarily likelihood, this is just the initiators on how that potential feature may, may fail. The dam was designed back in uh, the early part of the century, uh, or last century rather, and uh, the standards for design were different back then. So if you were to apply today's standards to this structure, it wouldn't 
meet today's standards, right? So we take a look, that's why we do the structural analysis. We want to understand what the factor of safeties are. We really want to understand what the condition of that structure is. And then concrete deterioration over time, concrete deteriorates, that's just, you know, the nature of concrete and steel, right? So we want to understand how it's deteriorating and do some service life modeling to see, all right, what sort of remediation efforts we want to take to prolong that life of the concrete, right? So looking at the entire dam, to help be economical with our, invest our investigation program, instead of studying the entire dam, we picked four distinct areas. And I'll walk through what's unique about those areas and why we picked those to help represent the entire dam. Again, to be economical, this is an active asset. Uh, you know, to fully study it and dewater it is out of the question, right? So we have to be very targeted about how we want to investigate this to get representative analysis for the structure itself. So Bay 1 is over on the, the left non-overflow <laughs> section. This is a unique bay. It's one of the only bays where when they did the remediation effort back in the 80s and they put ballast gravel and, and blocks in there, they actually uh, pulled back the gravel and they didn't put it all the way up against the, the uh, upstream slab. So we have uh, a lot of access to that upstream slab and we have it's one of the larger slabs where we have almost continuous access to that so um, that's a primary reason why we study this particular one this slab also or this bay rather this is bay number one uh, does have some active delamination going on this is common throughout the structure uh, but it is it does have active de delamination on the corbel uh, so that's another reason why we picked this this particular bay So Bay 9 is a very unique bay. This is in the overflow section. Uh, as David mentioned, there's H2S gas, which is presenting itself on the downstream side and uh, being very um, aggressive on the concrete and steel there. You can see here a couple of examples. There's a seepage collection pipe there that has deteriorated and collapsed. Uh, and then the, the photo on the right is a picture of uh, the buttress. And, um, Kind of hard to tell scale, but just the H2S gas turning into sulfuric acid on the on the surface of that. And for the wastewater folks in here, you're probably familiar with that. Um, that it has started to eat away the surface of the concrete by up to four inches, right? So it's starting to eat that material away. Bay number 24. This is a the second bay in the overflow section. This one here. Uh, in this cross section, this is the one bay that was within the section of the dam that moved uh, back in the 80s, or what was discovered in the 80s. It likely started moving when the dam was originally constructed and was discovered in the 80s and then uh, quickly remediated. So this is one of the ones that did move. Um, and there are some unique features like this possible crack feature on the upstream slab uh, that is of interest. And so this is the second bay in the spillway section that we will be evaluating. And then lastly, Bay 31. This is on the right non-overflow section of it. Uh, the right non-overflow section, there's a lot of active delamination going on in the, uh, in the corbels. Uh, and this is one that is unique to the spillway section. And now we have a representative one on the right non-overflow section. So that's an overview of the four bays, why we selected those. Been done to it, or is that just what's gone after the, the layer? Of That's active right now. The repair hasn't been done. They've there, there have been a number of these repairs, like I mentioned on one. The the BRA staff up there has been doing a good job on ones that have progressed quite a bit. Have started to repair those. So there are a number of bays that do have repair sections. This what do you do this, on this a delamination? I mean, are you putting a sealer on it? I mean, and this is just a question of ignorance because that's a lot of concrete. Right. Typically, the concrete's removed. The steel then is inspected and it may be coated. Uh, if it does have corrosion on it, most of the instances where uh, delamination has occurred, there's corrosion going on in the steel. Uh, there may be additional steel that's put back in, uh, and then in some cases you may put in some other uh, corrosion reducing measures and then uh, concrete or grout uh, placed back. So as part of this, there's, there's two main things that we're going to be doing. One's non-destructive testing and then one's what we call destructive testing, which is concrete coring, extracting concrete cores from the structure. 
and uh, sending them to the lab to do a series of tests. Uh, so the, the NDT and the coring will occur on those same four days. This is an overview. I won't go into detail on everything this year, but there's approximately 50 cores that are going to be taken. Uh, about half of those will be from the upstream side and half of those will be from the downstream side. What's very important about the concrete coring and the NDT testing that we're doing is we're studying the different parts of the structure and the different environmental exposures. This is very important because concrete behaves differently based on the environmental exposure. So you may have uh, concrete that is shallow submergence, you know, concrete that's in the dry, concrete that's in uh, the deep submergence down at the bottom of the lake where you have very low dissolved oxygen, very cold water. Uh, you have Bay 9 where you have the H2S gas in there. You have concrete that's right at a um, uh, right at a water level that's partially submerged or intermittently submerged. So you get wetting and drying of that concrete. <coughs> Some portions of the structure have sunlight UV exposure and are warmer throughout the day. Other ones don't. So each each section, each piece of those concrete will behave slightly differently and will impact the, the concrete and the deterioration over time. So we want to study all those different environmental exposures. So this coring program is set up specifically to look at each one of those environmental exposures throughout those four bays. So this just looking at what the section looks like and where, where the core locations are going to be. They're going to be uh, both on the buttress and the slab. Uh, we, the structural engineers took a very good close look at where these cores are being, being taken. Uh, how deep they're going to be taken, where they are within the structure, so that there's no, uh, you know, potential risk to the structure. Uh, to put this in scale a little bit, you know, these are going to be 12 to 18 inch deep cores. Portions of this, of the buttress and the slab, uh, are up to 10 foot thick. So these are, this is a massive structure, and uh, we're taking cores that are maybe 12 to in, 12 to 18 inches deep. Uh, and again, the structural engineers took a very good close look at that to make sure we were not putting anything at risk. And then once the cores are extracted, they're immediately photographed and then prepared and filled back in with grout. Um, and then those cores are taken off to the lab to be tested. So here's an example. This is a coring. This is a core that came from uh, gate two pier plate for the pier plate replacement project. Um, and this, this is a good example of a core because there was a piece of steel that was taken out of this. So they will do a series of tests on this. Anything from uh, petrography to take a very close look at that. They can also look at the steel under an electron microscope to look at, uh, you know, how, how the corrosion is progressing at a microscopic level. There'll be a series of chemical tests that are done, strength tests, both compressive and tensile strength, and then a formation factor test, which really helps you do service life modeling for that material. And then all that coring data is coupled with the non-destructive testing that is done. And these, these testing methods, like Mike mentioned, we evaluated over 20 different NDT methods uh, for this. And the NDT methods that were selected and the destructive methods that were selected uh, were reviewed to complement each other and to help validate each other. It's very important that when you do NDT testing, you also have destructive testing that complements or validates your NDT. So you use those two in concert. So that's how the program was set up. So it'll be a series of uh, impact echo, GPR on the non-destructive side, and then concrete coin. That's, um, uh, that's essentially what we'll be doing on the underwater side, and then lab testing right there. So GPR is really penetrating radar? Correct, yep. And part of this, you're looking for things you know, through the uh, lab testing, ASR, you guys were mentioning ASR earlier, that's a different ASR. This is alkali silica uh, reaction or AAR, which is you have chemical reactions within the concrete that produce a silica gel, uh, which can slowly deteriorate um, concrete over time. So it's, it can be pretty destructive. The good news is the, la the cores that we've taken in the past uh, show, show very slight instances of ASR. So overall, the structure, the concrete for the age uh, is in very good shape. But one of the reasons why we're taking representative samples across here, the dam was built over several years. Uh, ASR is, is, um, can, be, can be influenced by the aggregate source where the quarry came from, uh, the water that was used when they mixed the concrete. And throughout the life of the construction, uh, they likely changed quarry sites, and so the material 
may have changed. The water quality that they had while they were mixing the concrete may have changed over time. So just because you don't have ASR in one part of the dam doesn't mean it's going to be the same in another. You want to understand that. Yes. Just curious, you um, <clears throat> you send divers down to operate the coring machinery then? Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. And these will not be our BRA divers that you may be familiar with. These will be uh, outside divers. Replace the cores that are taken out. I'm assuming replace it goes back in. So yes. You know, open <clears throat> stress point. Right. Yep. They're patched um, almost immediately. Mm -hmm. As soon as they get that out, we want to make sure we photograph that core hole and then it'll be prepped and repaired immediately. Has the history of, of PK always had this high degree of salinity? Uh, yes, the water quality, very high chlorides in the water naturally occurring. From my understanding, there's a subwatershed upstream that uh, has very high naturally occurring chlorides in there. And so you'll get seasonal fluctuations of uh, chlorides are ranging from 100 parts per million up to 1,000 parts per million in the lake. So very, for uh, uh, surface water, right, non-salt surface water, very high chloride uh, and very aggressive on the, uh, on the concrete and the steel. So as part of the assessment also here for the investigation program, we took a, we took a look at feasibility and execution. You know, this is an active asset, and so we have to be very cognizant of uh, you know, the existing operations don't want to get in the way of any existing operations, don't want to have to uh, do any major structural changes to be able to access things. So we went through and took a look at feasibility of each one of these tests and uh, accessibility and coordinated with the BRA staff uh, for that work. So a lot of the test is going to be used with uh, using SPRAT, a lot of the NDT to get access to that, where guys will tie up and they'll uh, build a system to uh, get contact with uh, the underside of that structure there. And then we mentioned the underwater side, which should be done by divers. And then with that, you know, the overall goal here is to extend the service life. So through this whole process, keeping that in mind, uh, being targeted and economical about how we do this uh, so that we can extend the service life of the structure. So. Time that this has to be done. When this is complete, what are we estimating extending the service life back? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, it's an 80 year old structure with um, continuous and targeted repair and maintenance. This, this structure could last, you know, another 80 years or another 200 years, right? I mean, it's the, the uh, life of dams is really predicated on the ongoing operation and maintenance. So that's what we're targeting is how do, how do we continue this? Because the concrete will continue. Uh, to deteriorate over time. So you want to be targeted and credible with how you're repairing that to maintain the service life of that structure. Right. So what we're looking at with your organization is not a one-time fix. This is going to be a perpetual. Right. Part of the repair program will be ongoing. Right. There's some things that may, uh, in the O&M world, you know, you have um, scheduled maintenance, you have <coughs> immediate maintenance, which may be something needs to be addressed right now, and then you have monitored maintenance so you know we'll put those into those categories and say okay this should be done now this you can put into a repair program and execute you know for years to come and be again and be targeted with that so that uh, with such a large structure and so many complex features you know being targeted with where those resources are going to extend the service life obviously obviously you do studies for other entities that that own dams um, where does this put the BRA? Are we are we part of the group, or are we looking way ahead at, at issues involving the Morris Shepherd Dam? I'm, I'm just curious. Or is this something that we're trying to catch up with something that everybody else is doing? No, uh, uh, both. I mean, part of the SQRA process is to take a look at things down the road. I have to say, as an organization with the staff and the folks that you guys have out there in your maintenance program. It's impressive what you guys are doing. You are uh, you have an excellent staff up there, which keeps very good care of the structure. I see structures that um, all over the map, ones that nobody takes care of and are just in horrible shape. And then I put this one up there as in terms of how uh, dedicated you guys are to the structure. This you guys are in the top from what I see. I see all over the map of 
structures that don't receive any maintenance to this. And um, so it's impressive what you guys, the staff that they have up there and the capabilities that the staff has as well to maintain the structure. Good news. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Before we open it for questions, Mike, would you do me a favor and go back to your slide where you sh the show the lake in a barge? The reason that I want, I want you to see this pointed out in the bottom picture, because of we'll use the word risk here, because of the high risk of the water quality impacting the dam, years ago we, built the, we bought the barge and we bought the crane, and we have a maintenance crew that basically works from one side of the dam to the other, uh, making sure that we're doing what we can do to protect the dam. And I also want to make sure that the board and the public that are watching this understand we don't have any data that suggests that this dam has any significant issues at all. It's old. Uh, it's got some wear and tear on it, uh, but it's in very good shape. Uh, and from our perspective in the, uh, uh, the what am I trying to say, the, five, the annual inspect, the inspections that we have indicate that the dam is, is solid. Uh, and from our perspective, we're trying to get out ahead of real big picture, high dollar, uh, projects on on one being the concrete and, and then the gates and, and things like that so I don't want uh, people that are watching this on YouTube to, to, to walk away from this thinking that we have significant uh, we're, we're near failure we use the word failure because in the analysis of all the components that's that's how they're evaluating the different pieces of, of structure yeah I appreciate you clarifying that I was gonna do the same so uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it, it's very similar. I guess we want to draw an analogy. It's uh, it's how we, if you want to take care of your own personal health, uh, there's a cost associated with doing that in advance, but there's a greater cost if you neglect it. So that's kind of analogous. Um, I do have a resolution for the board's consideration. Director Anson, we didn't answer your question. Your your question was the timing of making the improvements. Once the evaluation of what the improvement fixes are, that's when we would prioritize based on risk and develop that scheduling cost. And we would utilize our resources that we have at the dam to make those uh, subsequent repairs. Just one final question. So, sure. so you're satisfied that after the four feet of movement took place that the remediation for the foundational aspects... Well, four, was, four inches. Four, I'm sorry, four inches. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a, that's, a, that's a whole different... Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Four inches. Four inches. Director, the width of, please continue. The width of my hand. That those that those remediations were successful. I mean, so Mike, answer that question by talking about the surveys that we do and how we monitor that. Yeah, that, that's a good point because uh, we monitor the dam actually on a daily basis, but we do uh, monitoring on a quarterly, or monthly and quarterly basis. But we've installed, uh, uh, I guess, uh, precision points on the dam. So we'll, we'll go, we'll hire a consultant every year and then every five years, they'll come out and they'll take uh, survey readings and they'll look at that. Then we'll also take our data from uh, the different Pisometers and extensometers, the, the different types of data collection devices, and that's telling us whether or not there's been any additional movement. And so we send that off to a geotechnical engineer, and they review that on an annual basis and on a, a, a five-year basis as well. So that it's very detailed uh, on the five-year basis and pretty detailed on the one-year basis. But we're also out there daily, you know, looking at uh, it, it did a chunk of concrete fall off or something like that. So we're continually monitoring that, and we've seen no movement. So I also want to add something of significance. We have no reason to believe that the four inches happened suddenly. It happened sometime between 1941 and the early 80s. So we have no reason to think that the dam just slid. But, but yeah, not four feet. Good question, though. It's a great question. Uh, th this resolution seeks the board's authorization to amend the contract with again at Fleming and to proceed with phase two. We anticipate the cost to be about $877,000 for this phase two component. Uh, you can see here in the board resolution that we're requesting $964,000. Part of that is to uh, for BRA probably to do some, uh, we haven't figured it out whether BRA or uh, 
again at Fleming would be performing some uh, small environmental work uh, and then there's also some work uh, associated with uh, I guess some unforeseen cost uh, I don't expect that to be an issue uh, phase one the construction or the board approved five hundred ninety set five hundred and ninety thousand dollars uh, we contracted with Gannett Fleming for five hundred and thirty five thousand dollars and they spent four hundred and seventy or about eighty eight percent of that uh, fee so uh, again at Fleming's very cost conscious I don't anticipate that but I, I would rather have that in the resolution so uh, there's about an eight or ten percent markup uh, over what we anticipate the fee to be which is eight hundred seventy seven thousand there is in our uh, bus budget year uh, we do have program 1.35 million dollars so we do have enough money uh, within the budget to cover the projected expenses and I can answer any additional questions related to to this project if you have any. Michael I just want to say um, thank you very much for your leadership and your educate education to the board on this you know, we have a responsibility to maintain um, our our water for our citizens <coughs> in Texas so um, thank you for doing this incremental incrementally and to continue to educate us on the way thank you we have one more comment and then read the resolution please I'll turn the thing on. Um, you know, when you do an asset management service level type analysis, I guess, you talk about the four inches and all this other good stuff. The tranches uh, get pretty narrow and constricted on service level on a, on a scenario like this. It's pretty stark and it's, you know, you've got to sit down and say, well, there's a difference between a traffic side falling over and getting replaced and maintaining that, or a pothole being replaced on a freeway, then analysis of a dam. So you don't want to. Coming back to what David said, I don't want anyone to come around thinking, oh, this is some sort of a giant risk of an imminent problem or anything of that nature. It's just you, when you do this kind of planning, you have to plan for a very narrow risk range. And so I think it's appropriate that you're doing it and making sure to explain to folks why you do it and why it's not because of some sort of an imminent threat. It's to make sure an imminent threat doesn't happen in the future. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. I have a quick yes, comment to the benefit the new board members that we have. We're all familiar with governmental entities where if something gets budgeted, it has to be spent um, and the taxpayers pay for it. it the BRA, the ratepayers pay for it, and they keep us honest that when we budget something, we don't necessarily spend it. The over budgeting is so that we don't have to come back to the board a second time, and it makes efficient use of the board. And I, I for one, appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very the way y'all aggressively attack these kind of issues, it's very impressive, and, and the skill level, and the, I mean, it's just overwhelming to sit here and see that. And uh, this can sound sort of dumb, but are, are dams insurable at all? Is there any federal program or? They're not insurable, but what we do is we insure the liability around the dam. Okay. And, and secondly, are there any federal state grants that help with the dams or something infrastructure wise to, um, especially being very proactive, preventive? Is there anything out there that you've seen? From, from time to time, there are some. Uh, from time to time, some of those federal. Uh, opportunities also have federal strings attached to them okay uh, so but as we move forward and begin to realize what those big fixes look like we would certainly look for assistance if if it were the right package sure thank you all right you read the resolution thank you the following resolution is presented for consideration to the board of directors of the Brazos River Authority for adoption at its January 27 2020 meeting be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager or CEO to amend the contract with Gannett Fleming Inc. to perform Phase Two Engineering Services at Moore Shepherd Dam in amount not to exceed $964,000. Okay, you've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Uh, Judy Crone, Director Crone, and second by Jen Henderson. Please vote, Board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Abigail? Yes. Director Bourne? Yes. 
Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. <laughs> yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Agenda number five, the Board of Directors will conduct a closed meeting and executive session on the following matters. To consult with attorney regarding litigation with respect to the Allen's Creek Reservoir pursuant to the authority granted by section 551.071 of the Texas Open Meetings Act codified as chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. At this time, I ask that the Board of Directors will now move to the main conference room.
The board of directors hereby recons reconvenes into open session at 11:53 a.m. Is there a resolution for the board to consider? Yes. Uh, I make a motion we authorize an additional three hundred thousand um, dollars as on the screen right now for uh, litigation expense related to the Second. Would you like me to read the full resolution? Please. Be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority that the General Manager CEO is hereby authorized to increase the initial contractual not to exceed amount for legal services in relation to Allen's Creek and Texas House Bill 2846 by $300,000. All right, we heard a motion by uh, Director Lloyd, and it was second. Smith. Second by David Savage. You've heard the risk. Um, please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Abraham? Yes. Director Boren? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Crone? Yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director <coughs> Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. All right, we are going to go to item number seven. Discussion and possible action on annual review and adoption of the Brazos River Authority Investment Policy by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Go ahead. He's, he's waiting on the slides. So we're going out of order. <clears throat> okay. We're going out of order? Yeah. Going to oh. seven. <laughs> Skipping six. Okay. Okay. Come back. Just fix that. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Just okay. This is. Do you want to go ahead and switch? To the next one? No. We need to go to the next. You're not? Okay, I got you. There we go. Why don't we just to start the Go ahead. ahead. We're yeah. ready. Thank oh, you. There it is, right there. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, when we ever make a, any changes to the investment policy, Public Funds Investment Act requires that we bring it to the board for uh, the, your approval and ratification of it. Uh, <clears throat> We had two, uh, there's a red line copy of the policy in your handouts that you got. <clears throat> there were two on page 10. That we, we just wanted to clarify what, what's meant in the policy. The first was uh, that accrued interest is part of the collateral for the CDs. Remember our CDs are 100% collateralized. In practice, we do the accrued interest, but the policy just doesn't state it. So that's what we did for that, for clarification. The second one is, <clears throat> it's not clear as to the letter of credit that has requiring two additional days before expiration on a letter of credit. And so we just put the word in, non-renewable in there. And then last, we just had in the account broker, dealer broker, the uh, name change from FTN to FHN Financials. 
And if there's any questions, I'll read the resolution. Seeing there's no questions, please read the resolution. <clears throat> Be resolved by the Board of Directors of Brazos River Authority that it has reviewed and hereby adopts Brazos River Authority's investment policy, including investment strategy statement, approved broker dealer list, and approved training sources as presented in the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority on January 27, 2020. So moved. All right. Mm -hmm. You've heard the reading of the resolution. There's been a Motion made by Rick Hubert and a second Jen by Jen Henderson. Please call the board. Signing Officer Flores. Yes. Director Tallis. Yes. <coughs> Director Taylor. Yes. Director Abraham. Yes. Director Boren. Yes. Director Henderson. Yes. Director Hubert. Yes. Director Crone. Yes. Director Lopez. Yes. Director Lamor? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? He's not uh, in this chair. <laughs> Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Agenda item number eight, discussion and possible action on ratification of the 2020 rates for the replacement water supply agreement, two-tier contracts by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Okay. <clears throat> to start off with the uh, replacement water supply agreements, which is called basically a two-tier type contracts. These agreements came out of a rate case back in 1991. There were 14 agreements, approximately 99,000 acre feet. <clears throat> 75,000 acre feet of that is made up of two uh, customers, which is Dow and Bell County. What it means by two tier is basically you have activated water or election water, which is the water used, and then you have non activated, which is the optional water, and it's half of the other rate. Back in July, when I gave you the rates, uh, established the rates, this was only an estimated rate at this time. The, the agreements call for us that we uh, have to wait for the CPI uh, index that comes out in November. Uh, it usually comes out in December from the November one. It's published late, so therefore we can't get that into our uh, 20, uh, 2020 budget. Uh, we did send out letters to the customers telling them of the proposed rate and the fact that we'll have to take it to the board for ratification. The proposed rates uh, for changing from activated water, election water, is going from 2758 to 2782 of 24 cent increase. And non-activated goes from 1379 to 1391 of 12 cents. Um, these, the CPI is plugged into a special formula that came out of the agreements, so that's what causes these rates to go up only that amount. Once we approve the uh, two-tier customer rates, we'll bill out to the customers. David. Yes. When will these rates expire, the terms? Uh, these contracts run out to 2040. 2040? 2041. All right, see no other questions. Please read the resolution. Okay. Be resolved that the Board of Directors of Brazos River Authority hereby ratifies the 2020 rates of $27.82 per acre foot for the election use water and $13.91 per acre foot for the optional use water as adjusted in accordance with the formula stated in the existing re replacement water supply agreements. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Motion made by Director Wilson and second by... John Henry. John Henry Please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores. Yes. <clears throat> Director Tallis. Yes. Director Taylor. Yes. Director Abraham. Yes. Director Boren. Director Henderson. Yes. Director Huber. Yes. Director Crone. Yes. Director Lachance. 
Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Lisa, would you please would you please pull Director Bourne one more time? Director Boring? Yes. Agenda item number nine, discussion and possible action on retirement committee membership by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Okay. Uh, this agenda is covering the ratification of members to the retirement committee. I do want to state that the policy does say that the uh, uh, presiding officer of the chairman of, of the board has the authority to make selections, change the officers, composition, the size of the, the committee, but it, it does require coming back to the board for the final approval. Um, the, the retirement committee serves over a defined benefit plan. This plan was frozen some many years ago, and at that time when it was frozen, it did have employee contribution balances in it. Uh, we had to wait till the IRS approved it a couple of years later, so we put BRA members onto that committee. <clears throat> Since that time, the plan has been frozen. It doesn't have any employee contributions to the plan. The plan is funded by BRA's actuaries, figuring out the amounts that need to be put into the plan, and we put, make those uh, payments every year, as well as the performance on the market uh, investments that the committee selects. We feel, though, that the BRA employees being on the committee, since it doesn't have any more employee contribution, probably doesn't make any sense anymore. So, uh, presiding officer Flores has made a decision to put five members of the board onto this committee. And uh, what I'd like to do is read the resolution to uh, uh, nominate those people onto the, the board. Any questions? See no questions. Read the resolution. Okay. Be resolved that the retirement committee shall be compromised of no more than nine members and no less than five members selected with the board of directors. And be further resolved that the board of directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby ratifies presiding officer Flores' appointments of the following individuals to serve as members of the retirement committee. John Henry Newton is chair. Ford Taylor is vice chair. Uh, Jim Henderson. Royce Lee Leslie and Jeff Tallis. The appointed members of the committee shall serve on the committee until successor is appointed. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Motion made by um, Director Sand Samuel San Sanderson. Sanderson and second by Judy Crum. Director Crum, please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores. Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Abraham? Yes. Director Boring? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Crum? Yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Going back to agenda item number six, discussion and possible action on amendments to the operating policy manual by Riley Wood, Senior Staff Counsel. Loud. Um, good morning, or I guess afternoon now. Um, so a after legislative session, every two years, we get together, take a look at the bills that were passed. Um, Matt takes a, a first look at those, and uh, we determine whether or not there's any um, bills that require us to amend our operation policy manual. And after review this year, we've come up with just a few. I guess we can go to the next slide. I don't have a clicker. So um, 
I think we've got eight on here after review. They're pretty minor. We gave you all, I think in your all's packet, a um, sheet with red lines of each of those changes. Uh, the first one would be to this section 3.1 and procurement. We actually, a couple sessions ago, the um, legislature passed a statute regarding um, not doing business with companies that boycott Israel. This last session, they amended it to um, uh, be not as stringent as it was. So you've got to have more than 10 employees, and, and I think it's a, maybe more than $100,000. But previously, we didn't have that in our um, uh, operation policy manual, so we decided to go ahead and add it. Um, the procurement section 3.3, there was some conflicting contractual language in there in the statutes before two conflicting statutes and they cleaned that up and we, we had that conflict referenced in our own operation policy manual and so we're just deleting that. Um, 3.4, uh, procurement of legal services. They passed a new law that requires local government entities, if they're going to enter into a contingent fee legal contract, that there's a process you have to go through getting board approval and then going to the AG and getting AG approval. And so we are adding that as well to the policy manual. In 3.8, additional miscellaneous methods of procurement. Uh, previously, the Comptroller's Office, which operates for state agencies, which, which we are not under most circumstances, uh, allows them, they, the Comptroller's Office has a travel services um, uh, feature that, that allows you to use different rates for air travel or hotel stays and so forth, and they're making it open to other local governmental, governmental entities, so we're adding that. We can go to the next slide. Section five in the financial audit, you know, we had, we talked about that this morning, and I believe David talked about the different places we've got to um, submit that. And, and one section of the government code requires us to submit it to the comptroller's office, and it allowed a, an additional option of being able to uh, publish it on our website, which I, I believe we already do, so, but we're adding that as well. Uh, section 5.5, a uh, statute with past requiring cybersecurity training for local government entities, the employees of local government entities that have access to computer systems. And so we're adding that as well and we'll be uh, implementing that. In 6.1, uh, there was a provision related to uh, 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 notifying a local emergency operations centers of dam operations and, and once again this is something we already do we were ahead of the game on this and, and we've, we've always done that but, but this was added now as a statutory requirement so we're adding it to um, our operation manual and finally property rights this is pretty simple that allows uh, entities that resell vehicles or that um, put them out for auction which we do to issue a temporary um, uh, buyer's tag for those vehicles. So we're adding that in as well. <coughs> and so I'll open it up to any, if anybody has any questions on anything specific that was there that you'd like to ask, I'll try to answer to the best I can. Yes, sir. Now explain that again on, on the, the boycott of Israel with contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the legislature, I think it was a, was it a couple years, two sessions ago? Yeah, two sessions ago, passed a, a statute that says that governmental entities cannot enter into contracts with a um, firm that boycotts okay. um, Israel. Okay. And, and there, there's some other aspect to it as well. But, but that boycotts or supports boycotts of Israel won't do business with Israel. And what they did this legislative session, because that was that was pretty strict, and it and, and you had firms that maybe had just one person in them, or that were that were just offering a consulting job or whatever. So they they went back and modified that statute and limited it to firms that have over ten people and that it's you're doing a hundred thousand dollars or more in work for the entity all right seeing no other comments or questions go ahead and read your resolution 
Yes, ma'am. So be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority that the revisions to the Operation Policy Manual of the Brazos River Authority be accepted as presented as January 27, 2020 meeting to be effective January 28, 2020. All right, you've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to it, ja, uh, Director Wilson, and second by um, Director Dr. Ruiz? Please call the board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Abraham? Yes. Director Boren? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Crum? Yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. <coughs> Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Ruiz? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Director Yancey? Yes. Agenda item number 10, report and possible discussion on projects update by Lake Kettler, technical and services manager. Presiding Officer Flores, uh, we, are, we have reached a point in our agenda where we have no more action items. And this project update is just something that's reoccurring that we like so you can read about some of the things that are going on in the basin. Uh, I would propose, because of time, if, if there are questions, we can have Blake address those questions. And if not, we can move on to the next agenda item. And I can have you at lunch in 15 minutes. Does anybody have questions? Throw that in there. All right. I, I have one comment. Yes. Um, so I reached out to Blake recently for some questions and just wanted to say thank you to him for taking the time to answer my questions and deal with the, the technical things I brought up. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Item number 11, report and possible discussion on fiscal year 2020 first quarter budget report by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, as I remembered, uh, mentioned earlier that, you know, the budget we, we showed to you, the numbers are, uh, I'm just going to go to the financials here. Th these are primarily cash basis, so <coughs> these are expenditures that we have. Uh, I do want to mention, though, in revenues, uh, in the first quarter is where we get most of our revenue. We have 60% of our revenue uh, taken in in the first quarter in cash from our contracts. Right now, the, the variances are pretty small. A lot has to do a little bit of the timing differences and lower spending. Uh, the capital projects, as we mentioned, talking about uh, Allen's Creek is a, is a very large portion of the 47 million. And so that's uh, where we stand right now, what we believe the variances on that. Here's how we spend the money in the first quarter. Any questions? All right. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to number 12. Report and possible discussion on fiscal year 2020 first quarter investment officers report by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Okay, we are required by Public Funds Investment Act to present the quarterly the, uh, the portfolio we have. We're currently sitting at $139 million uh, in uh, investment. This is a two-year trend that we have. Again, the 139 is up 19 million because of the large amount of cash we recover in the first quarter. This gives you an idea of the investment blocks that we have in, and we do this based on what we see our cash flow needs are or where we can get the highest returns on our investments. And the last is just showing that we're at uh, 229 basis points, or 2.29%, and we are outperforming the Texas pool and the six months treasuries for that. So it's well worth our time to do the investments. To the, the 20 or 30 basis points that we earn on top of that on $130 million is quite a bit of return. Any questions on that? All right. Seeing no questions. That's it. I will entertain a motion to adjourn at this time. That was Director Huber and Henderson. Henderson. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.